for the next couple of days, we're going to focus on the concept of civil liberties. Civil liberties are your individual protections, specifically against the government. These are freedoms that we have yet to surrender to the government. We talked about how most of your freedoms we've given up, we've surrendered to the government, like your freedom to kill, and your freedom to rape, and your freedom to rob. These freedoms, we specifically forbid the government from taking them away. So civil liberties are your individual protections against the government. These are guarantees of freedoms that are protected from any arbitrary, which means unreasonable, government interference. The government is not supposed to take these liberties away from you arbitrarily, unreasonably. So these are freedoms that are protected against the government, and they're not supposed to take them away from you unreasonably. Your civil liberties are the only thing that protects you from the government. Any questions? So what was it again? So again, these are individual protections against the government and they protect you from arbitrary government interference. Conveniently, there's a list of these civil liberties that government is not supposed to take away from you. What do we call that list? Constitution. The Bill of Rights. In the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights lists these civil liberties, like your right to bear arms, your freedom of speech. These are your civil liberties that the government cannot unreasonably take away from you. But the key word there, guys, is unreasonably. It's not that they can't take them away from you. There are situations and there are circumstances where the government is allowed to take some of these freedoms away. Just because a freedom is on the list of the Bill of Rights, it doesn't mean the government cannot take them away from you. There are situations where they can. Civil liberties are not absolute. Civil liberties are not absolute. There are situations, there are circumstances that even freedom of speech, right to bear arms, these civil liberties can be restricted and can be limited. The default should be not allow the government to take away these freedoms. That should be the default unless there's a good reason to allow government to limit your freedom. Again, the default should always be don't let government touch these. Don't let government take these away and limit these unless there's a good reason to take them away. That's our problem though as a country a reason that you might find convincing to allow government to step in and limit some freedom, another person may not find convincing. Like during the pandemic, for example, when the government says, hey, you have to wear masks, that's a restriction on freedom. Some people believe, hey, there's a good enough reason to restrict that freedom because the pandemic is going on. But there are some people in this country that didn't find that the pandemic was a good enough reason. Your Second Amendment, your right to bear arms, Today, a lot of people believe the mass shootings that have been happening, the school shootings that have been happening, and those are good enough reasons to allow the government to limit the Second Amendment. But some people don't buy it. Some people are not convinced that those are good enough reasons to limit the Second Amendment. That's the problem that we have as a country. The reason that you might find convincing to allow the government to step in to limit freedom, another person may not find convincing. After 9-11, my generation, we have to struggle with the fact that our government was torturing terrorists to get some information out of them, right? Is preventing another 9-11 from happening a good enough reason to restrict people's freedom? Or is it not a good enough reason? As you're growing up, these are things that you have to struggle with. What reasons would you allow government to limit the freedoms that we're going to be talking about today? So again, a compelling reason differ from person to person. This is the difference between a liberal and a conservative. They think differently about which freedom should be limited and why they should be limited. Today, our main focus is on the First Amendment, particularly freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is so important to our founding fathers that this is the first freedom that they guaranteed. The Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution starts with freedom of religion. It reads, Congress or the government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. From that sentence, we get two clauses. Clauses means phrases. The free exercise clause and the establishment clause. These are the foundations of freedom of religion in the United States. Both of these phrases guarantee two different things that you need to be aware of. Some of you have a very superficial understanding of what freedom of religion means. A lot of you think that freedom of religion means that in this country, you're allowed to believe in whatever you want to believe. 
that's already true. Whether or not we write it down in the U.S. Constitution, whatever you're thinking about in your head, the government cannot control. Right now, Tommy over there can be thinking about sex. There's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing Joe Biden can do about it. The belief itself does not need to be protected. What needs to be protected? The belief does not need to be protected, but the exercise of that belief needs to be protected. That's what the free exercise clause does. The free exercise clause prohibits the government from prohibiting the practice of religion. The practice of religion. Yes, so again, the exercise clause prohibits the government from prohibiting the practice of religion. So it's not your belief in Christianity that is protected by the First Amendment. It's going to Sunday Mass. It's getting communion. It's getting baptized. The practice of that belief needs to be protected, and that's what the Free Exercise Clause does. If tomorrow Texas passes a law that says no more Sunday Mass, then they would be violating the Free Exercise Clause because they're prohibiting you from practicing what you believe in. So freedom of religion doesn't only mean that you're allowed to believe in Islam. It also means that you're allowed to pray towards Mecca five times a day. You're allowed to practice Ramadan. Freedom of religion doesn't just mean you you're allowed to believe in Jesus Christ, it also means you have the right to preach and you have the right to get baptized. The government cannot prohibit you from exercising what you believe in. Any questions? Again, the free exercise clause prohibits the government from prohibiting the practice of religion. That's not very controversial. Most Americans can get behind that. This is the controversial part of the law of the First Amendment. This is where we get to a lot of arguments between Americans, the establishment clause. The Establishment Clause says that government cannot make any law that would respect an establishment of religion. This is what you should know. In the United States, 70% of Americans would consider themselves one form of Christian or other, either Catholic or Protestant, but most Americans believe that Jesus Christ is God. Right? What's the official religion of the United States? We don't have one. We cannot have one. The First Amendment particularly prohibits us from having one. The Establishment Clause says that government cannot make any law that would respect an establishment of religion. So even though the majority of Americans are overwhelmingly Christian, our country, our government cannot be a Christian government. We're specifically prohibiting, prohibited from establishing a national religion. We do not have an official state religion. The First Amendment particularly prohibits us from having one. Like in the Middle East, for example, Islam is their official state religion. In the United States, our First Amendment prohibits us from establishing a national religion in this country. But this is where we get to some gray areas. Not only does it mean that we don't have a national religion, that our government is irreligious, our government is secular, it also means that our government cannot favor one religion over another. When our government makes laws, when our government makes policies, they're not allowed to promote one religion and knock the other ones down. Because by doing so, they would be establishing a national religion. So just because we have a sizable Christian majority in the United States, it doesn't mean that our government gets to make laws that favor Christianity over the other religions, because our First Amendment specifically prohibits us from doing that. So, nor can it favor one religion over another. Here's how I remember the Establishment Clause. Think of the Establishment Clause as a wall. It separates religion and government. They're not supposed to intermingle with one another too much. If you ever heard of the phrase, separation between church and state, that separation is the Establishment Clause. It's the wall that divides our government from religion. Our government has to remain secular. It has to remain irreligious. Any questions? Alright, if you don't believe me, these are quotes from our founding fathers. This one, in particular, is very important because James Madison wrote the U.S. Constitution. Religion and government will exist both, both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. And that is the idea behind the First Amendment, to make a government that is non-religious in nature. 
Now, this might seem unfair to you all, because some of you here are Christians, but imagine if you're not Christian. Would you want the government making laws that favor the majority religion over your religion? So it's probably better to have a government that is not religious in nature. Any questions? Today, tomorrow, and the following days, we're going to be talking about Supreme Court cases. Because remember, the Supreme Court decides whether or not the government is violating these civil liberties that we're talking about. Every Supreme Court decision establishes what we call a precedent, spelled with a C-E, not an S-I. A precedent is a guideline. Precedents are guidelines that future courts will look to when faced with a similar case. Again, these are guidelines that future courts will look to when faced with a similar case. In this class and your other classes, we don't talk about Supreme Court cases because of their importance at that moment in American history. We talk about Supreme Court cases because they matter for the future. When the Supreme Court is making a decision about a similar case, they look to the past and they use those decisions to guide their decisions in that current case. That's why it's important to talk about Supreme Court cases. Our first case is Employment Division versus Smith. This is a Supreme Court case. Here's the facts of the case. There's a restaurant in Arizona that employed Native Americans as workers. These Native American workers, every time they have a break, they would go in the back of the restaurant and they would smoke. The problem in this case is the issue is they weren't smoking cigarettes, they were smoking a substance called peyote, which in Arizona was an illegal drug. They get fired and the government denied them unemployment benefits because they were fired for committing something illegal. The Native Americans complained to the Supreme Court that the act of smoking peyote is part of their what? Religion. Religion. And it should be protected by the First Amendment. Which clause are we dealing with here when it comes to freedom of religion? Is it the free exercise clause or is it the establishment clause? In other words, are we dealing with the question of whether or not the government is trying to stop people from practicing their religion or are we dealing with the separation between church and state? This is about the free exercise clause. This is about whether or not a government policy is stopping people from um, practicing what they believe in. And in this case, the Native Americans are arguing that the government is trying to prohibit their exercise of their religion. Good so far. Alright, so here's what the Supreme Court decided. That Arizona law that prohibits people from smoking peyote, was that law specifically created to prohibit the Native Americans from practicing what they believe in? Was that the reason? Was that, was that the goal of the law? No. What's the goal of the law? To stop people from what? From doing drugs. That's the goal of the law. They don't want people in Arizona taking drugs or doing drugs. That's the goal of the law. They weren't specifically targeting the Native Americans' religion. Number two, is there a good reason for this law? The Supreme Court said yes. Not allowing people to do drugs is a good reason to have a law like this. So here's what they decided. Laws that restrict certain religious practices do not violate the free exercise clause if, number one, the law doesn't specifically target a religion. The goal of the law is not to prohibit a certain religion. And number two, the government has a good reason for that restriction. And in this case, the Supreme Court said there's a good enough reason to allow the government to restrict drug use in the state of Arizona. So here's the point I'm trying to get across today. Not all religious practices, just because it's part of somebody's religion, is protected by the free exercise clause. If it is, I'd like to invite you all to my religion that doesn't believe in paying taxes. So we all don't pay taxes together. Is that possible? No. Because that religious practice, that religious belief, would not be protected by the free exercise clause. That makes sense for everybody. So besides drug use, there are other religious practices that are not protected by the free exercise clause, including animal sacrifices. There are religions that believe in sacrificing animals. But that's not protected by the free exercise clause, according to the, to the Supreme Court, that there's a good enough reason to restrict that practice. That's why today, in all states in the United States, animal sacrifices are not legal, even though it's a part of some people's religions. This one in here is polygamy. Anybody know what polygamy is? Give you a hint. Gamine means marriage. Poly means many, like a polyhedron. Oh, many sides. What is this? 
being able to marry multiple people. In some religions, men are able to marry multiple wives, like in Islam, for example. But no state in the United States recognizes um, polygamy. Just because it's a part of a religion, it doesn't mean it's protected by the law. So polygamy would be another one. Imagine if the Supreme Court decided differently, right? Imagine if um, Derek over here has a religion that believes that killing babies turns his God on. Would he be able to kill babies? Would that religious practice be protected by the First Amendment to be exercised upon this? It wouldn't, because there's a good reason to stop him from practicing his religion. Any questions about this? So again, not all religious practices are protected by the Free Exercise Clause. If there's a good enough reason to restrict a religious practice, it will be restricted. Next, Engel versus Vitale deals with a very controversial topic. Prayer in public schools. Public schools like Nikki Rowe, for example, is part of the government. I'm a government employee of being paid by the government, right? So I'm bound by the Constitution. I'm bound by the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause. In New York, in the state of New York, they tried to have school prayers in public schools. Every morning, the state of New York would have their teacher lead the student body into a prayer before the Pledge of Allegiance, before um, the things that we do today. This is the prayer that they compose in New York. What kind of what kind of case is this? Is it about the free exercise clause or is it about the establishment? about the establishment clause and whether or not government is promoting religion. So this is an establishment clause case. So New York tried to have a school-led prayer. Obviously, there is going to be controversy on whether or not this violates the separation between church and state. So New York said this. This doesn't violate the establishment clause for two reasons, according to the state of New York. Number one, it's going to be voluntary. If a student doesn't want to pray along with a teacher, he or she will not have to. It's a voluntary prayer. Number two, it's going to be non-denominational. If you don't know what non-denominational means, it means that it doesn't call on a specific God. It doesn't call on a specific deity. So this prayer right here, for example, it just says God, but it doesn't say Jesus. It doesn't say Allah. It doesn't say Buddha. It's a non-denominational prayer. So with these two provisions, New York's thought that they're avoiding a constitutional violation. Now, you already know what the Supreme Court decided in this case, whether you are aware of it or not. You live in one of the most religious states in the United States, the most conservative religious states. In every corner, if you go down Ware Road, you'll be able to see a church in every corner. If you think, do you think if we can get away with public school prayers here in Texas, we would have prayers? We probably would, but do we? No, we don't. Why? Because the Supreme Court ruled against New York. They decided that even though that prayer is non-denominational, even though it's voluntary, it's still government promoting what? Promoting a religion, which violates the Establishment Clause. That makes sense for everybody? That's why today, in public schools, we are not allowed to lead you guys into a prayer. We're not, we're not allowed to have a school-sponsored and promoted prayer. Whether you agree with this or not, that's up to you. The Supreme Court has been wrong before. All these cases that we're going to talk about, you can disagree with the Supreme Court decided. All I'm telling you is what is currently the law of the United States. And currently, today, public schools are not allowed to lead students into a prayer. So school-led prayers violate the Establishment Clause, even if they're voluntary and even if they're non-denominational. Any questions about this? Anyway. All right, next, Santa Fe ISD versus Doe. In, during, before every football game in Santa Fe ISD, the school would have a student volunteer lead the student body into a prayer before a football game. What's the difference between the case we just talked about and this case? Uh, Who was leading the prayer in the previous case? The previous case. The teacher was, the school was, a government employee paid for by the government was leading the prayer in Engel versus Vitali. In this case, who's leading the prayer? A student volunteer is leading the prayer. The question is, is a student-led prayer like this unconstitutional? Does it violate the Establishment Clause separation between church and state? How many of you think it does violate the Establishment Clause? 
Well, you would be wrong according to the Supreme Court. They believe that this is still a violation of the Establishment Clause. Why? Because who gave that student the platform to lead the school body into a prayer? The school did. The government did. Which means this is still government promoting what? Religion. Here's what it means, guys. Obviously, tomorrow, during second period, if Ms. Kaufman comes on the intercom and she starts praying towards Allah, obviously that's unconstitutional. That's a violation of the establishment. But if Alejandro over here does that over the intercom, what's that, would that still violation, violate the establishment? Yes, it would, because who gave her that platform? The school. She was given that ability by the school, so it's still school promoting a religion. Make sense for everybody? Anyone confused? All right. So, school sponsored or promoted prayer, school sponsored or promoted prayer, violates the establishment clause, that separation between church and state that we've been talking about, even if it's student land. I know guys in sports, like so some of your coaches, they kind of like toe the line when it comes to this during competitions. I don't want to know, right? I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Here's what I, 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 can, I can tell you. If a coach leads you guys into a prayer before a game, for example, that violates the establishment clause according to the Supreme Court. Even if they weren't the ones leading it, just the act of participating in a group prayer with their athletes would be a violation of the establishment clause. So if you're part of a prayer like that, then you might have a case against your coach or against the school. I want to also clear up some misconception. This doesn't mean you're not allowed to pray in public schools, right? It's just that the government cannot sponsor it, the government cannot lead it. If you want to pray privately before an exam, for example, some of you need it, you're allowed to do so. If before a game, you want to get your friends together, get your teammates together and pray on your own, you're allowed to do that. It's just that the coach is not allowed to initiate it, and the coach is not allowed to participate. Does that make sense for everybody? I'm confused. Don't tell me about situations like yours. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Westside Community Schools versus Emergents asked the question of whether or not religious school clubs should be permitted in public schools whether or not religious organizations, clubs, should be allowed in public schools. Again, you know the answer to this question. At Nicky Road, do we have a religious school club? Yes. Yes, we do. What do we what do call it? Well, the FCA. What does that sound? Actually, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, right? We do have a school club here at Rome because according to the Supreme Court in this case, religious school clubs do not violate the Establishment Clause for two reasons. Number one, they're non-curricular, which means you don't need them to graduate. Do you need to join that club to graduate here at Rome? Most of you didn't even know that it existed, right? I, I didn't know for, for a long time that it existed. But yeah, you don't need it to graduate. It's non-curricular. And number two, when does it usually take place? Friday. Friday? During school? No, after or before school, during non-instructional time. So religious school clubs, do not violate the Establishment Clause. It doesn't violate that separation between the church and state according to the court for two reasons. It's non-curricular and it takes place during non-instructional time. But you need to be very careful when it comes to religious school clubs. If I was a teacher sponsoring that club, I don't know who sponsors FCA, but whoever sponsors it, if they're getting paid to sponsor that club, then that would be a violation of the Establishment Clause because that would be government paying for religion. That's not allowed. Number two, if one religious club is allowed to exist, all other religious clubs are allowed to exist. So since we have a Christian organization here at Rome, um, if Derek over here, I'm sorry, I keep using it. If Derek over here wanted to form a satanic club here at Rome, and she tur he turns in an application to Ms. Kaufman, and Ms. Kaufman tells him no, then that would be a violation of the Establishment Clause because that's government favoring one religion over another religion. So if you're a Buddhist and you want to form a Buddhist club, you should be allowed to do so if a one if another club is already allowed to exist, like a Christian club like FCA. Don't try to form a satanic club to troll. If you're a satanic a Satanist, then you're allowed to do so. Alright, anyone have any questions? Alright, I'll take your place. Keep these. I'm not gonna give you another copy. We're not done with it yet. Sir, what, what's, uh, what would it be for exercise or 
Oh, this is establishment clause also. All of them are establishment except for employment division versus employment. Again, guys, if you disagree with some of these, that's okay. It's just what is currently law right now. Good luck.